and welcome to the Grace Wong Guild 2023 version of our book festival. We can see there's a thread through it. I'm the executive producer of this schedule, and I'm realizing it's a pretty technical show, Sean. We've got great people who've uh, come from great di directions in their backgrounds and threading things together. And uh, Jonathan, when we started doing the prep on this, I had mentioned that it was going to thread together. And I'm close, right? So we've had very much so. guests, and you're number seven, lucky number seven in the casino, the most likely number to roll on a pair of dice ever. I learned that from the mystery man Cardano. We've covered a number of books this morning. This is what they look like on covers. Jonathan has the only publication that's not on a cover, and he'll explain that for us. He's got a great journey. He's a great friend of the guild. Thank you for your participation today. And we're going to talk about your focus on uh, leadership and uh, what we do in the world and how you publish too. I'm going to be poking you on that area and the choices you've made to get your word out and the mechanisms that you use to distribute your ideas. Jonathan, please introduce yourself to the Guild and join us at the festival. I'm going to give you back the screen to use it as you will. Thank you. And well, I know Doyle already thanked you at the start, but to you and Sean and to all the others behind the scene who put this together, uh, it, it's a great event and we're all very appreciative. So when you told me that I was going to be following a child's book reading, I thought, <laughs> you know, that's going to be an awkward segue since I'm really going to talk about how we... Uh, how corporations can think about change and uncertainty. And I thought that's going to be very discontinuous with what Chuck has, is likely to say. And I honestly, I'm having one of those synchronicity, serendipity moments because, you know, these themes of, of agency and making a better world, uh, I couldn't think of a better entry point to, to what I want to talk about than what Chuck's just talked about. And in contrast to what uh, Doyle and Chris and Louise have, have focused on, I deliberately wanted to think about organizations as the, um, rather than individuals, as being the organizing mechanism. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And maybe I could uh, share my screen. And You've got a new someone tell me. Whether, whether you're actually seeing that? All good. All good. Okay. So my theme is really making the world better. Uh, so very much along the lines uh, of what Chuck was just talking about. But I'm, talk I'm talking specifically in the context of how, given the changes that we've seen over the last 10 years in particular, how we should think about the discipline of, of strategy. Because we come to a very awkward place. This is the PwC 2023 um, CEO survey that came out in January this year. And this is a stunning statistic that nearly 40% of CEOs do not think that their companies will be economically viable a decade from now if they continue on the current path. Um, that is a sobering, and yet I want to argue a very optimistic idea, because if we'd asked this 10 years ago, the answer probably would have been zero. That many, that corporations thought of themselves as perpetuities. And I think the various crises that we've been encountering, whether it's uh, climate change, whether it's income in inequality, whether it's lack of social inclusion, have all brought us to a point where whatever we're doing, it doesn't seem to be working terribly well. And because corporations are financially motivated, when you go from valuing something as a perpetuity, an assumption that it will continue on its current path, and you then start valuing it as a, a finite income stream, well, actually, there was a perfect example only earlier this week. So BAT, British American Tobacco, uh, six years ago, brought, brought Pall Mall, Camel, uh, 
is it Native American Spirit and one other brand from from Reynolds American and they paid they paid sixty one billion dollars for the acquisition two days ago they wrote down thirty one billion dollars of that and it's a very dramatic illustration of okay we thought the Camel brand was going to go on forever and therefore we valued it as a perpetuity of its current earnings sorry I'm betraying my background in finance. And now you go to saying, no, you know, Camel, uh, 30 years from now, Camel won't exist because it's a cigarette brand and we won't be doing cigarettes or cigarettes won't exist. So I think that we're, we're at this stage where many companies are looking at their business models and going, you know, that we're having the oh shit moment of, OK, there, there's no perpetuity here. We're going to need to change. And I think that that recognition um, that it is in companies' own interest to change is actually the most positive thing. So I want to talk about how that might change. Um, and I was just, my PowerPoint skills were just quick enough to incorporate this slide from, screen grabbed it from Chuck's presentation, because I think the problem with, with lack of sustainability is that one of these seven um, fundamental prerequisites for what makes something sustainable is being abused in our current system. And until we infuse these principles of humanity back into the way we do business, then business will, will, won't be a, a, a force for good in the world. So that's, that's where I want to get us to. Maybe I could start the story from the beginning because I, you know, I began my life in finance. And um, actually at the Bank of England uh, in London doing macroeconomic analysis. And for the first 10 years of my career, numbers like this famous ad from the 70s, numbers were my life. I believe that if there was anything worth saying, it could be said in numbers. And I went and did an MBA and then I went from uh, business school directly into strategy consulting and this philosophy survived into advising companies on how to run themselves better. And I, I then had an epiphany moment and it wasn't Smirnoff, it was actually J&B that was the cause of my epiphany moment. And it wasn't actually that I was drinking it, I was advising on the strategy for J&B French market just after they passed something called the Loi et Vin, which forbade the showing of people enjoying alcohol in, so you couldn't run, you can no longer run advertisements, whether posters or, or um, TV advertisements showing people actually enjoying your, your, your drink. So the question was, is that the end of brand? And, uh, you know, of course we looked at this and I had no concept of, of how humans perceive value. So this was all about, you know, how could we manage the cost base? And I realized that, you know, a product like J&B, the thing you need to understand is what's the role that it plays in the lives of human beings? And can that role be preserved even when you can't have advertising? Because advertising is just one mechanism of reaching them. So it began this lifelong or subsequent lifelong obsession with, with how do humans perceive and receive value because ultimately customers are the source of cash flow of business. And therefore, if you don't understand what your customers value, you can't understand the basis for your franchise as a business or as Peter Drucker put it, the, the, the purpose of a business is to create a customer. So um, it led me to write my first book, which was called Vulcans, Earthlings and Marketing ROI, which was my attempt to explain to my former bosses at the Bank of England and, and at the strategy consultancy that I hadn't gone completely off the reservation by getting into brand consulting. I was creating value, but I was creating value in a different way. And my fundamental observation was that we have this underlying assumption in business that that human beings are very functional and rational in the way that they weigh up their options and the best product wins and that's all there is to it. And, and so my conclusion was 
actually there are no brands on the planet. Vulcan, Vulcans are perfectly able to calculate which is the best product at, at the at the right price. But unfortunately, you know, they don't take into consideration because they're Vulcans and we're earthlings and we care about things like beauty, belonging, connection, meaning, purpose, transcendence. And how does that really fit into our calculus of business? And um, so I've been at this kind of a long, <laughs> a long time. So on the left here on your, your screen, and this is a bit of a flex. Um, I know Chris talked about working with Nelson uh, Man Mandela. I'm, I'm going to humble brag about having worked with Prince Charles. Well, Prince Charles as he was then, King Charles now, because he had this really interesting business forum where he was bringing companies together to say, you know, what's the logic for going the extra mile? The language of a uh, triple bottom line had only just begun to be popular. And, and Prince Charles was really very keen to encourage organizations to be forces for good, to go beyond their own self-interest and, um, and try to be them the engines of true progress within the world. So this was the, um, so we called the, the, uh, the campaign, the human capitalism campaign. It's this idea that we're pro-capitalism, but we want capitalism with humanity in it. And on the right-hand side, so nearly 25 years later, is a piece I, I wrote for Harvard Business Review um, last year, which was really a little bit behind my question to Chris earlier on today, uh, where does what's the, that intersection between individual purpose, the way I think Chris explained, explained it as meaningfulness and corporate purpose? Do corporations have purposes in the way that we understand them as, as human beings? And, you know, we'd like to believe that these two forms of progress are, are well aligned, that there's material prosperity uh, the the source of abundance and there's also social progress and for a long period of history it really did believe it seemed that technology or the technologies of the day which were really science and medicine really were forces for good on on the left hand side you've got just how dramatically child mortality um the drops in child mortality have been since essentially we understood the nature of disease and, and on the right hand side just the the green revolution and um you know particularly the the invention of the haber bosch process for synthesizing ammonia which completely you know told uh, turned malthus's prediction of mass starvation just said no technology really can solve these problems and increase the uh, you know the population capacity of the world and so that all seemed well and good with science and medicine but um it seemed to translate as digital technologies came in and we we believed google when they said that you know their goal was or their mantra was don't be evil and we believe facebook when they said that the work their goal was to make the world more connected and I think I agree with Chuck that that the the thing that soured is this digital technology and its ability to um, cause us to think and and behave in ways that contravene those seven basic precepts of of what makes for uh, what makes for humanity. So this all looks terribly naive, and you know we thought we were sauntering towards this this techno optimist future where man and and the planet would live together in in harmony. And um, but then, of course, the the harsh reality of you know what happens when profit and purpose aren't terribly well aligned. And of course, you know, ten days ago we had the most fantastic case study of. of of this, where you've got the uh, OpenAI has a non-profit uh, board, and it controls the for-profit subsidiary. So, in their articles, they say the for-profit subsidiary is fully controlled by the OpenAI non-profit board, and 
And whilst it's okay for it to make profits and distribute profits, it's subject to the mission. And the mission is, is the benefic is not the shareholders. The, mi the mission is humanity. Well, you know, we all know how that story ended when profit and purpose came into um, conflict. I think profit registered an, an, an outstanding win, or as Tyler Durden would have put it from Fight Club, how's that working for you? And the answer is, yeah, it's, you know, this is more like the vision of humanity that we're, we're currently facing. And um, I guess my, my goal in the rest of the talk is to, is to take the red pill and say, you know, what's the reality of the world in which we're working and how, how can we work with it to make it better rather than being naively op optimistic. So how do we recognize that business is actually not, it's not necessarily malevolent, but it's certainly not the benign force. Good is not naturally going to happen. We need to engineer the systems to produce good. Because at the heart, I would argue of our thinking is, is this fundamental an anthropomorphic flaw that when we talk about purpose in the con context of an individual, we, we don't need to qualify it. We know we're talking about their higher purpose, the thing that gives that individual meaning. And we completely mistakenly project that idea of purpose onto corporations. Um, and we assume that corporations are moral actors. And we have to remind ourselves that corporations exist to ensure their own commercial survival. That's what they were created for. And those are the incentives that they, they follow. And we just need to be realistic about the fact that the, the matrix, the corporate matrix that we live in is the fact that corporations, they're not immoral, they're, they're simply amoral. And they act, I sometimes call them like commercial democracies. They have multiple constituencies that they need to to pander to and the success of any corporation is is it its success at, at integrating the needs of multiple stakeholders um the problem was that we we evolved this rather simplistic view of um the stakeholders that actually mattered because so long as capital was the scarce resource we favored the providers of capital and so we had this situation that lasted for maybe 50 years from the famous um, New York Times article by Mil Milton Friedman. And all that, that 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 led us to have this very distorted view of strategy, which was that strategy is about understanding the potential for making money. So on the, the left here, you see Michael Porter's favorite famous five forces, but it's really an industry attractiveness measure of what is the what is the opportunity for capital to be invested at an excess return in this industry. That's what the five forces were to do. Is this an industry that um, has barriers to entry that will allow us as an incumbent to prevent other people to earn in perpetuity some excess return on capital? And on the right of you, this is the famous BCG growth share matrix. But again, just note how very simplistically financial the parameters were. It was about measurable market share and, and market growth rates. And it was all about the capacity to generate cash or absorb cash. So we, we endured this financialization of strategy. Um, and it led us to think of strategy as a kind of financial exercise in, in financial efficiency. It also, I, I would argue, led to this, um, I guess it's a, it's a decline towards a, the lowest common denominator in terms of behavior. We really, we like to think as individuals that we behave in ways that are socially optimal, but corporations, you know, especially if you tell them that their financial incentives are all that matter, they, they can operate in the realm of what's, what's legally permissible. Um, they won't incorporate externalities 
unless you force them to. So, you know, carbon credits are a really good example of trying to ally the true economics of business so that you actually get corporations to internalize the real cost of what they're what they're doing in terms of pollution um, or, or carbon production. Because then, then you can rely on the mechanisms of the market to for the corporations to adjust their behavior. Price signals are, are exactly what, you know, they are the incentives to which corporations respond. So change the price signal and you'll change the behavior. Don't mandate the behavior, change the, change the incentive. So I guess we, you know, the beginning of wisdom and the understanding of the matrix is to realize that the, you know, these two vectors that we, for a long time, we thought of as being terribly well aligned are actually possibly completely orthogonal to one another. There's this one vector that is about material prosper prosperity. If there's a profit to be made in a free market economy, people, you know, people will do it. Um, independent of whether that that activity is negative, neutral, or positive for, from a social progress point of view. It's not that, that businesses are amoral or immoral. It's just that they, they operate according to this calculus of profitability. So I, I think the challenge to us and, uh, is really about agency of how do we how do we change the incentive? If we want a better world, how do we change the incentives that we encourage businesses to recognize? I have already talked about this, the, but I think the great advantage of this is that it's turning sustainability, which used to be an ethical um, subject into a very practical commercial subject. And so the, the, the changing context for strategy, I, I'd say, is we've gone from this in partly through digitization and, and globalization, we've gone from this presumption of industry stability that, were, that the five forces encouraged us to, to think about to a presumption of change that um, industry boundaries are falling in a way that we 20 years ago would never have conceived of as being possible. And we've gone from this environment of shareholder primacy that ultimately capitalists the scarce resource to a sense that well actually the planet may be the scarcest resource or talent is the scarcest resource or or the approval of society may be the scarcest resource so how do we start consciously factoring in the interests of multiple stakeholders with the goal that you know it's not just an excess return on capital um, but some form of prosperity that is consistent with social progress is, is our goal. So my analogy is, that, is this idea that we used to think of strategy as rail. It was this picking this point on the horizon and then we would lay, you know, lay down, blast our way through all the obstacles or build the, the bridges necessary and lay down the rails on which the corporation was going to travel towards this um, articulated point on the horizon. And that was okay when there was industry stability and that was okay when the rules of the game were relatively simple, um, but we've now moved to, I'd say strategy as sail rather than rail, that there are a set of forces like wind and tide and weather that we don't completely control and that strategy is about adaptability and, and resilience in the face of forces that we don't necessarily control. And, and that's the underlying hypothesis behind um, the strategy of change, which currently exists as a, it's a nine part um, series within um, MIT Sloan Management Review. And as I say, the underlying hypothesis is, I know this quote is misattributed to, to Darwin. He never actually said this. It, this was a summary of Darwin's thinking that, was, uh, that someone gave years later. But uh, you know, allowing, allowing for that, I think this, this idea that it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one that's most 
responsive to change. So it's not the, the idea of fittest in, in the sense of strongest, but fittest in the sense of being best fitted. And so I think that is, that I, I would, uh, I'm arguing is the essence of the, the new approach to strategy, which is uh, if strategy is a process of ad adaptation becoming best fitted, how then the tools of strategy should be those that are that allow you to understand both when and and how to change. And so I'm going to canter through the a, a few of the the the, the, the slow article. So the first one we wrote was was called Changing How We Think About Change, which made a very simple point that the, the word change actually incorporates three rather different forms of of um, change. There's 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 the incremental change, which is um, where you, you're doing something, but you're you may turn up the volume a little bit on it. Then there's there's change as in uh, your goal remains in um, worthy, but the tech the tactics that you're using to reach your goal seem a little bit antiquated. And then the third version of change is it's just not working for you. So change is it changes disruption. And of course, it was very popular to think in terms of um, that you should either double down, which would be reinforcing your magnitude, or you should pivot. That became the language. But people overlooked the fact that actually adaptation generally didn't mean changing your objectives. It meant changing your tactics. So it was a, it was a sort of simple start to the bit, to the, the series. And then we then we argued that if change really was about adaptation, how did you know when you needed to adapt? And we put forward this idea that um, the way you, you judge the type of change that was necessary for you to pursue was on these two dimensions. One, were you being useful? Because ultimately the, the purpose of a company is to create a customer. And if you're not being useful, you're going to lose your customers. And the second dimension was this notion of relative advantage to, to the extent that um, you were doing something useful, was it distinctively different from your competitors? So um, fit to purpose was really a proxy for what's the size of the market you can serve and relative advantage became a, a, a proxy, I guess, for pricing power, the extent to which you could um, charge a premium. And so that then moved on to the third where by which time we, we'd been running a survey and it was, it demonstrated that fully two thirds of the companies that we had invited to uh, take this survey plotted in this center zone, which was that their strategic goals were absolutely valid. They just, they were just getting declining returns on the tactics they were using. So they were, you know, in some senses, some of them were just not using new digital channels or that they'd allowed their you know, their product portfolio to get a little bit stale. There was nothing really wrong with the, the strategy. There was something wrong with that they'd got a little bit lazy in how they were pursuing it. So it was, it was this idea that, you know, strategy wasn't this five-year exercise. It was a perpetual um, analysis of the degree to which you were fitting your, your, your desired, the needs of your, your target audiences. So we went on then to talk about it's not just customers. It's often, you know, great strategy is, is a, um, thinks of your, the, the entire ecosystem. And we proposed with embedded within the, the research was this idea that we um, assessed corporate performance among customers, but also among employees, among partners, whether those are suppliers or distributors, uh, what was the strength of your franchise with communities, how well thought of were you, were you by investors and, and how well regarded were you from a, an ESG perspective. And this idea that, that you couldn't necessarily 
improve or it it, it wasn't right to to just try and think about one improving your performance on one dimension it was this thinking of it as a system and could you systematically improve your performance across multiple multiple constituencies simultaneously because that's really what strategy is it's an integrated set of actions so we then started talking about well everybody said thinks that innovation is a strategy and it's well innovation isn't a strategy <laughs> innovation is a means to a strategy so what sort of innovation should you be um, engaged with depending on your change signal so obviously if you're if your your business is doing well and you've got a winning formula much of your innovation investment should go towards reinforcing your advantage whereas if you haven't got a winning formula much of your innovation should go to a disruptive form of innovation it was relatively i mean as to say it it may it sounds so obvious um that that depending on the type of change that you're trying to achieve so so your use of tactics should change anyway yeah as i say there are now nine in the series so we then talked about you know how change might uh, or the the particular form of change influences the style of leadership how how you it alters the way in which you think about performance from being compensatory to combinatorial was the idea that, that you can't make up for a deficit on one dimension by outperformance on another dimension. That's the old form of capitalism. The, the new form of systemic um, requires you to have a, ba a basic level of performance across all dimensions. Um, so it's combinatorial in that sense. And then you know, Bed Bath and Beyond was just too perfect an example of um, of what goes wrong when you take your eye off the ball. That ultimately you're trying to be useful and distinctive to customers, not financially engineer your way into a higher stock price. And then we most recently we talked about culture as as a really as the central nervous system that that. Uh, determines how well information flows from the corporate center to the field and back again and and suggested that the fidelity of the transmission of those messages is really what matters so all in all it's it's trying to encourage a more structured and holistic way of thinking about corporate performance and we we have this um it, it, it's running permanently this uh this self-assessment, I was going to say it's a survey, but it's really a self-assessment that in that corporations can take and it generates a, um, a report on which tells them what their change signal is, what their percentile rank is on different dimensions of, of corporate performance. And it, it's really just designed to help them think about uh, on what dimension should we be thinking of of change? And just to repeat, I guess where I where I sort of began this discussion, the the two primary dimensions of are you, are you actually being useful as a corporation? You know, your raison d'être is you're not there to save the world. You're you're there to be useful and to create a customer and to create employment and to be a good a member of your community and to contribute hopefully to the the commonwealth within which you exist so first and foremost be useful and then secondly you know be be distinctive whether that's as an employer or you know as a partner or even a you know as a member of the the community in which you in which you exist and just finally to sort of bring these things together uh, the interesting thing for me is that this comes back to the basic three C's of strategy, that strategy has typically been described as this, uh, this set of interactions between a, com a company, its customer or customers and competition. And, you know, the goal for any, co for any company is to be as relevant as possible to their customers and as different as possible 
from their competition such that they will be differentially preferred by their, by their customers. And so viewed through that lens, the construct that we're saying of fit to purpose is really all about that closeness to the needs of the customer. Relative advantage is the degree to which you're perceived to be different from what others and are offering. And I think from a the, the untold story is really around what is it that is unique about your resource base or resource fitness that allows you to be increase your relevance or your or, or your distinctiveness with customers. So anyway, as, as I say, that that's really the, uh, the the idea is to is to produce a way of thinking about strategy that is more in line with the dynamic multi-stakeholder environments in which most companies um, now exist. And uh, I'd just like to end with this presentation, this discussion by Richard Rumelt, who's a now a emeritus professor at, at UCLA and founder of the Strategic Management Society. But he, uh, I think he wrote the best book on strategy, which is called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. And, he debunks so much of, of it, but he basically says that you know strategy means having a you know a good diagnosis about your current situation and what you want it to be, a guiding policy, which means that you're not just randomly um, you, you have an authentic and coherent way of of managing, and then thirdly, that you the, the things you do are systemic, i.e., they they move in concert with one another, and that's the way that you move the world the world forwards so i'm going to pause there i've got other material if, it, if it's relevant but i think i've covered everything that i'd like to say about you know how we can exercise our agency in the corporate environment in a way that nudges the world towards better outcomes because it you know it aligns the profit incentive with this social progress incentive. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, what a good tour and match. And I can see the wave as we've gone from individual action to taking care of our children to taking care of our companies. I think as a construct, uh, people think I, it, it amazes me that people think that companies and corporations are are old and there are have ever been and they're just a logical construct that's around forever and they're not they're relatively speaking based on a humanity of 5,000 10,000 20,000 80,000 years brand new yes. and uh, I like that you underline that they, wait a second there's some important ways to run them and sometimes we lose our way Mr. Friedman and uh, mm -hmm. even on Friedman, I'm seeing some oscillation on people going back and forth because of, uh, I guess, bumpiness in the economy. But when you think about leaders that are doing strategy well, who do you think of that if we were to go to like look at the lens of Jonathan Knowles of strategy, who's matching what you would want to be or good citizens in this? I see Google floating by with, oh yeah, do no evil, but well, not anymore. We changed that back. And um, our lawyers have forced us not to have any beta products anymore. We have to have finished products. So they never finish their products anyway. And they announced Vapor. Um, so who are you feeling is like, give me the good side of people doing strategy well and transparently in your lens, Jonathan. Well, it's a, uh, it's a difficult question to, to, uh, to answer because success is kind of proof of strategy. So, uh, you know, who's, who's doing well is who's being successful. And it's hard not to point to, obviously, you know, Tim Cook in particular mm -hmm. on that, but, but also just some of the bold moves that, you know, NVIDIA took of positioning themselves that NVIDIA feels like a complete rerun of the Intel story mm -hmm. of Gordon Moore saying, well, if, you know, if we'd been fired and this was day one, what would we do? So why wouldn't we do that? It's that idea that 
that my current business model is going to be obsolete. Therefore, I, you know, the riskless thing to do is to do something risky. And I think that that's profoundly worrying for most companies. So the, the default strategy has become mergers because that way you get oligopoly power and regulatory capture which is that you know we we spend lots of money in washington and we make sure that the rules so no 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 as a social media company we are not a publisher we are not responsible for to content on our platform where manifestly you know there's a degree of curation going on but we're going to stick with this section 230 exemption that was when we were a nascent industry and we've managed uh, to, to pull this trick where, whereby we have, um, you know, we've managed to resist relevant legislation. And I, so I, maybe I, actually I'll flick forwards a, a little bit further. So th th this is our two dimensions of, of, of progress, so to speak. And, and there are three vectors on, first of all, I think the first thing to notice is, is that private sector organizations live in this realm of material prosperity. That is their beginning and their, their end. That is how they are, are measured. So it, there's no, so long as we think that, that corporations are a good way to allocate capital, to its most productive use, corporations are a good thing. You know, we haven't found a better way of making the, the most productive use of shared resources. However, corporations need to be given the right incentives um, to behave correctly. And that means they need, and Friedman was misquoted, you know, because he said that they, that corporations should be free to pursue profits within the norms and laws. Mm -hmm. So Friedman profit, illegal profits, and Friedman didn't say um, unjust profits. Um, he, 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 he was writing at a time in which social norms were actually very strong. It's that, it's that loss of social norms, you know, the lack of um, shame that seems to characterize our <laughs> many of our politicians nowadays. I mean, I mean, the George Santos, I mean, you can't make this shit up. It's unbelievable how shameless that is. Uh, so I think we just need to be very much more conscious about the incentives. And the second point I'd make on, on this chart is that we, we need to recognize that there are types of progress that rely on public sector institutions and not for profit organizations that corporations are not the solution to the world's every one of the world's problems because if unless there's a, a profit to be made a corporation is not the vehicle for achieving that so we need our public sector institutions um, because they, they are the ones that deal with public goods and we need our not-for-profits because where there are minorities and i don't mean that in the the ethnic or or um you know, gender sense, I mean, just any group of people who are in a minority, so it could be, you know, neurodiverse employees, the public sector organizations need to cater to the greatest good of the greatest number, and they will necessarily overlook the needs of the minorities. So we, you know, we need charities that, that are worried about the great crested newt or the, you know, the wet, protection of the wetlands or preservation of disadvantaged members of society. And all three of these organizations serve their purpose because one is really to generate material prosperity. The other is to, is to advance the overall good and the, the other is to protect the needs of, uh, of minorities. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I went a long way from your first question, but I, I don't want to give moral leadership to mm -hmm businesses i mean i i think that you know th those that seem to be um taking the genuine interests of their customers into mind and trying to find a an equitable balance between um delivering value to their customers to their employees to being good members of the, uh, their communities those those are the ones that i think are are demonstrating mm -hmm. 
a sustainable business, but sustainable business is a commercial idea. It's not an ethical idea. Uh, it's fascinating in, uh, in its evolution and then the change. Uh, and when I was trained in, in school 110 years ago, um, that there would never be trillion dollar companies because that would be insane because that would be all the money would be in one company. That could never happen. And now there are six of them or five and a half, depending on how you count it. Um, so the drives into like, okay, well, we've got a construct that's actually created both monopolies and monopsonies at the same time that are so great. It's, I don't even, I can't even imagine what regulation means in the, in, and, I, and I see it in action, right? When I see, you know, people attempting to regulate Walmart, like, mm -hmm. so how do you regulate that? And that's just a national company. When they go international, and we're seeing it right now, there's one, one case of point in Canada, we've got a fight going on with Google as a country over news, and they're denying access to common software. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, if, I, if I can answer that question, I think there are, you know, exercising agency happens in three ways. Mm -hmm. Let's take for profit companies that are operating in this negative or neutral zone in terms of social progress, and let's give them an incentive to behave better. Right, right. It could be social incentive in terms of um, you know, serving, uh, you're so promoting uh, commercial sustainability, or you know, every time we promote places that are good places to work, mm -hmm. we're, we're tipping the balance in terms of how well you treat your employees. So there are th there there are those nudges that we can give by giving corporations in in. A social incentive. I mean, it, it can be name and shame as as well, but I prefer to think of those uh, as the the stick part of the question, the carrot part of the question. You know, how do we how do we make it in a corporation's interests? Uh, you know, through talent acquisition or access to partners or um, just public acclaim that that causes them to behave better voluntarily. You know, the second is is that we can change re regulation and we can say, I'm sorry, you either you can't do that any longer. So you can't. So that was the loi of in France was a, an attempt to to harness the demand for alcohol or you could think of as, as tobacco or here you could say the, the impact of in, including a carbon tax will render certain types of businesses no longer economic and they will exit the market. The third is, is actually this, and I think this is where we've, where thing, it used to be that so much of fundamental science was done by the public sector. It was initially funded when you think about GPS and ARPANET and space travel, um, you know, these were all publicly funded projects. And it wasn't clear that they were going to give rise to a commercial application. But I, I do think that there is, you could say that we're, we're beginning to do that in the States with the Inflation Reduction Act and subsidies on solar panels and so on, that we're, we're, try, we're nurturing certain industries to a point at which they will then become commercially viable and then they, and then they can move into the public domain. But I think these are the, if I think about agency, there are three, three ways we can do it. We can, we can act with our own dollars as, as individuals and employees and advocates. We can act with, through legislation by demanding better regu a better, better regulator environment. And we can also um, help identify technologies that that have massive social benefits but aren't necessarily yet ready for private sector commercialization well i wish that jonathan you and chris and louise and chuck would 
form either the think tank behind the political party or the political party that could put some of these policy, I'll call them bulwarks, right? The real frame that shapes things, right? Chris, I saw Chris flash in there. Uh, start the party now. Because when I read the political platform, um, I don't read it like this that are happening today. Hmm. Um, and yeah. uh, I do think that strategy and incentives are uh, strategy and incentives are completely interrelated. And thank you for articulating that. Was there any other questions from anybody else? Um, we are waiting for William to come into the green room. He's not quite here yet, Sean. So uh, I think that if there are more questions, please ask them. We've got time. I've got one for uh, the esteemed member of parliament, Jonathan Knowles. Um, you've, uh, you mentioned quite eloquently, I love the presentation, by the way, I, um, and um, I loved how you uh, were able to grab and piece things from the two presentations before and weighted it into your conversation and presentation. That's, that's truly, uh, what, uh, presentations on sale, not rail, um, which I love <laughs> as a line as well. Okay, uh want to go uh particular place with your argument around strategy being about change than any type of traditional notion. And part of your rallying reason was there's more things to consider, right? Like it's just not bottom line profit anymore. Part of my the the change might also or in thinking might also be our just complete romanticization of startups over the last call it 20, 25 years. Um and I sometimes try to square two things, Jonathan. I don't know if you have made the same challenge in terms of coming up with your your piece. You know, we love startups because there's real people behind them. There's great ideas. We feel like there's an energy and passion within startups that don't necessarily exist in corporations. Yet, in the same space in my head, I go, they fail just as much, if not more, than corporations, you know, by and large. They are afflicted with some of the the biggest biases that you could ever find. We see this rampant in Silicon Valley and some of the, the culture that kind of exists there. And from a strategic standpoint, I hear more founders brave about how much they failed as opposed to how much they learned uh, and how little strategy they put into their stuff as opposed to how much experimentation they did. I oftentimes try to try to square, first of all, I, I wonder if that feeds into your argument of strategy has changed and, and trying to square, you know, needing to be nimble and experimental and still needing to be strategic. Thoughts? Uh, it's, it's a great topic and it may take me too long to, to do it proper, proper justice. I, uh, I, I, so many startups are, you know, born out of a customer need. You know, I didn't find, you know, take Airbnb, for example. I mean, it's a wonderful story of, you know, I just needed somewhere to stay on somebody's floor and Airbnb was, you know, the idea was born. So uh, that's what I love about the great thing about startup culture is, is that it is inevitably born out of a frustration that there is something that I want to do and and there's no way of doing it. So that's, it's very, um, in that sense, directed in, in terms of the value that it wants to, to generate. You know, very few founders typically have thought beyond version one of their, so that they, it's often not founded on the, I want to change the world, although there is a, you know, there's a generation of startups that does that as, you know, as well, because they have a, a vision for, for changing either the type of data or the type of decisions that people, people make. So I, I, I find it very difficult to generalize, I guess, uh, but I do, the thing I most admire about startups is that it's, it's people willing to, you know, devote their energies to bringing about a change that they think is important. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, I agree. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you again for the presentation. It, uh, uh, as always, uh, we will follow up with a, a conversation on the side at some point soon. 
That would be great. This year, go ahead. Uh, Jonathan, uh, it was a very transformative, uh, and you really got me completely out of my regular uh, thinking style. And uh, thanks, I guess, to your uh, provocation and uh, awakening and uh, teaching. Is there any, do you think somehow you should perhaps implement your idea as a pilot for doctorate students, doctorate students developing a startup, let's say one startup for a certain category or multiple categories, just something to think for, the, just something to check for the feasibility, over. Yeah, I think it's a great, I mean, whether it's doctoral students or others, I, I mean, I do think that that being being realistic about what it's possible to achieve in the the public sector versus the not-for-profit sector versus the commercial sector is very important because I, I see a lot of people, um, very well-intentioned people, uh, you know, trying to get things off the ground where you know they can't capture, they can create value, but they can't capture enough of it. It's too diffuse. And, and you you realize that that corporations are not that they've, they've chosen the wrong organizational structure to do that in. They'd be much better off setting up a 5013C or, and then getting public funding to do it because they are, they are really trying to provide a diffuse social good for which no one customer is prepared to, to pay an, an adequate price. So it, it, is a public, it is a public service or a in that sense so um but it's hard because people want to do you know they want to believe that that people are prepared to pay for um something that is ethically good and the answer is not always um and so a, a better question is not is this good for society but is this useful for the people that need to buy this in order to give us the you know, we may not care about the money, but the money is is the is the lifeblood of the organization and allows the organization to, you know, to continue. And of course, that's the organizational zone dynamic. It, it, once you've set it up, it wants to continue because that's that's the metric of success. So it's always this. It's quite a difficult balancing exercise. Uh, and behind my question to Chris earlier as to to what extent should our own search for meaning um, be coincident with with the organizations for whom we work. Good stuff. Well, that Jonathan, thank you very much for your time, intellect, genius, publishing words, next book. So we're on a desert island. We already have your collection of articles. What other book do we have to sit around the fire to read to each other out loud? Oh, I'd have to say um, The Origins of Virtue um, by Matt Ridley, who was, uh, he was Richard Dawkins' student. So Richard Dawkins, who wrote The Selfish Gene, and Matt Ridley wrote um, The Origins of Virtue, which is his antidote to the, not an antidote to the selfish gene, but the idea of if at the, how do we square the paradox that if we're genetically selfish, how come we're profoundly collaborative as human beings? And it's a wonderful, wonderful sort of, I, I think it ties into Chuck's, um, you know, that there, there are certain norms that, that bind societies together and en enable us to live together with other people and, uh, and us to reap the benefits of that. Well, thank you for that one. I've never heard of it. And uh, that's great. Cause I was just going to bring Bono's surrender. And just read that out loud. But uh, thank you for that. Thank you for your time again. Good. And I'm going to stop things right now and uh, then restart them.